This morning, we're starting a new series on uh, members. What does it mean to be a member of His body? That's a phrase that we find in Romans 12. We find it in 1 Corinthians 12 that we are members of Christ's body. What does that mean? And I want to think about that specifically today with you from the sense of the body of Christ uh, universal, uh, the body of Christ at large, if you will. We're going to focus a little bit more on what it means to be a member of a local congregation in probably the next three lessons this month. But um, I want to ask the question, why are you a member of the church of Christ. Now, before we get into to that, I, I, I want to clarify some terminology, and I want to use an illustration to point out why it's important for us to clarify terminology. I want to ask you, what comes to mind when you think of the three following words? First word is the word bat. I was a baseball player in high school, so when I think of the word bat, the first thing that comes to my mind was a baseball bat. Uh, what comes to mind when you think of the word football? Um, football's about to start pretty soon here. Um, in America, we might think of people like Andrew Luck. That's, I guess that's kind of an old picture, isn't it? Um, throwing a football. What comes to mind when you think of the word Mustang? If you're a car person, you might think of a Ford Mustang, right? And all that, well, some of those muscle cars when you think of a Mustang. But maybe somebody else, when they think of the word bat, what they're thinking of is, you know, the scary little bats that fly around at night. Um, maybe when someone else thinks of football, especially people from every other country that's not America, um, maybe they think of soccer. You know, that game where you actually do use your, your feet to kick the ball. Um, they would probably argue that we have misnamed football here in America. You know, this is a ball that we're throwing around and handing off with our hands, um, yet we call it football. Some people, when they think of football, they'll think of soccer. And if you're a horse person, you don't really care much about cars. Maybe when you think of a Mustang, you think of this very strong horse. It's very important for us to realize that Words can be used in multiple ways, can have multiple meanings, and we need to make sure that when we uh, talk about certain concepts, even in the religious world, that we're on the same page when it comes to what we mean by that word or by that phrase. So, I want to ask you another question. What comes to your mind when you think of the term church? When you think of the word church, What's one of the first things that pops into your mind? Well, for some people, when they think of the term church, they think of a building, all right? They say, well, I'm going to go to church, and um, we just walked into the church, and, and they say that, and they're talking about a building sometimes. They talk about a structure. Other people, when they think of the term church, they think of the church as a denomination, you know, which church do you go to sometimes gets asked and sometimes what they're asking in a sense is what denomination do you go to what's the name of it um, what's your body of beliefs um, other people when they think of the word church they think of christ's body not in the literal sense um, but christ's body and the body of which christ is the head um, and the individual people are its members. That's how the body of Christ is described in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. He's not talking about each denomination being a part of the whole body of Christ. He's talking to the individual Christians in the church at Corinth that each one of you who is a follower of Jesus Christ, is a member of his body. And so when I ask the question that we're going to ask this morning, why are you a member of the church? It's really important for you to understand what I mean and what I think the Bible means when we talk about the word church. What does it mean? 
Well, let me give you a few ideas as to biblically what the church is and what I'm referring to when I ask this question this morning. I think we're talking about the church which belongs to Christ. When I use the phrase church of Christ, that's what I mean. I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about some denominational name. I'm talking about a church that is of Christ. Christ. In other words, belonging to Jesus. We are a people belonging to Jesus. Um, this church was built by Christ. Look at Matthew 16, 18. This is up on your screen. I say to you that you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. Uh, Jesus, even though he uses the term build, is not talking about building a physical building. We don't have any evidence that Jesus ever built a physical building. That's not what he's talking about when he talks about the church. He's going to build his church. The word church is from a, a Greek word, ekklesia. It means called out of. It's, it's used to refer to an assembly. We right now are an assembly of people. You've all been called out of your homes, and you've been called together here to worship God on the first day of the week. We are, in a sense, a, a local church, a local assembly of people. But this church that Christ was going to build was going to be an assembly of people who believed what Peter had just confessed, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He was going to build his assembly on that foundational principle. The church is then built by Christ. I'm not talking about an organization that's been built by anybody else but Christ. I'm talking about the church that has been built by Jesus. We're not talking about church built by Wesley or Luther or Calvin or any of those other popular denominational names. I'm not a follower of any of those people. I'm just a follower and I just try to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of the church which belongs to him. I'm talking about, when I talk about the church, I'm talking about a group of saved people. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, after people believed the message of Jesus Christ that was preached by Peter, they obeyed that message. It says the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Okay, so the church is made up of saved people. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a church. Um, it says in chapter 5 and verse 11, uh, the church was being, uh, the, the, the church was a little bit scared at this point in time because Ananias and Sapphira had just died. They'd just been struck dead. And after they see that they've just been struck dead because of the lies that they had told, great fear came upon all the church. Now, do you think the church there was a building? Buildings don't fear. It's just a material thing. This, this pulpit's not going to fear anything. It's just a pulpit. It's mindless. It's brainless. It's emotionless. Uh, what does fear? People can have fear. And so the church was fearful um, and had a, a deeper reverence and appreciation for God and for His power after the sins of Ananias and Sapphira were revealed. And so we're talking about saved people. We're talking about people that the church has been built by Christ. It's made up of saved people. And the church that I, I would also argue is planned by God. From the very beginning of time, when man first fell, God had a plan for how he would save his fallen people, his creation. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has always had a purpose to save his people through his son Christ Jesus and it's the role of the church to let the world know what that purpose is, to share that purpose with the lost world. And so the church was built by Christ, made up of saved people, it's planned by God and Christ is its head. Christ is its head. Look at Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and it says here that he put all things under his feet. This is God, by the way, putting all things under the feet of Jesus and gave him, that's Jesus, if you look at the context, that would be the last um, noun that this pronoun would connect to. He gave him to be head over all things to the church. So the church doesn't have two heads. 
It's not Christ plus the Pope. All right? The church doesn't have no head. It's not the members get to make all the decisions. The church has a head, and that head is Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church, and the church, it says, is his body. So whether I refer to it as the church or as the body, this passage would indicate we're really talking about the same thing as we talk about the church universal. The church is the body. It's the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus, in a sense, then, is the brain, all right? He's the one telling the body what to do, just like my brain tell my fingers to point this way, tell my feet to walk this way, uh, tells my body to stand here. Jesus is the one issuing the marching orders for his church and for his people. So when I talk about the church, I'm talking about the church where Christ is the head, and it is also a church that is purchased by Christ's blood. Some people will say, and I've heard this said before, why don't you talk about the blood of Jesus Christ? Why don't you just talk about Christ and not talk so much about the church? Listen, you can't talk about the church without talking about Christ, and you can't talk about Christ without talking by the church about the church because the two of them are tied together. The church has been purchased by Christ's blood. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, And so the church is people who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you have believed in Jesus, confessed Him, made the decision to turn from your life of sin, to follow Jesus Christ, been baptized into Him, that purchase has been made for you. You are a part of His church, His body. You have been bought by His blood. He has paid the greatest price man could ever pay for your pardon. He shed His blood for you. So when I talk about the church, and when we talk about it through the rest of this lesson, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I think the Bible is often talking about when it talks about the church in that sense. So, as we discuss the church, we need to agree on these terms. Have I proven to you that when I talk about the church, have I proven to you from Scripture why I believe what I do about the church? I've tried to quote a scripture with every single point that I've made so far so that we're on the same page about what the church is. All right. Nobody's disagreeing yet. All right. You can disagree with me later if you're silently disagreeing and we can talk. All right. So let me give you a few reasons why I'm not a member of the church. Why I am not a member of the church. When I ask the question, why are you a member of the church of Christ? And I'm going to encourage you that you should be a member of the church of Christ. I want to give you a few reasons why I'm not that. All right, the first reason is this. I'm not a member of the church because my parents were. Now, that doesn't mean my parents weren't, but I'm not a member of the church just because they were. There may be things that your parents have done or parents believed that you don't believe. You don't do it just because your parents have done it. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, he persecuted the church, and he says um, he actually advanced beyond his fathers. But at some point in time, Paul had to make a decision to quit acting the way the rest of many of his Jewish countrymen were behaving in order to follow Jesus Christ. He had to break from his tradition. He had to break from his parentage in order to be a follower of Jesus. And so um, I'm, I'm not a member of the church because my parents were. My faith has to become my own. Your faith has to become your own. You've got to do it because you have faith in Jesus, not because necessarily your parents did. I also would suggest to you that you shouldn't be a member of the church because you like the preacher. I hope you like the preacher, but that's not really why you should be a member of the church. One of the things that Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Paul never claimed to be a super eloquent preacher. Um, Perhaps he wasn't that eloquent at all if you look at what he says. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, and verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear, much trembling, my speech and my preaching. They were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. I don't want you to be a part of the church 
just because you, you think that your speaker is really good, the guy that preaches to you, just because you think he's uh, eloquent or sharp. Paul said, I don't want you to be a follower of Jesus Christ um, just because you're impressed with me. He says, I want you to be a follower of Jesus Christ because he was crucified for you. And because of that fact, you believe in what he's done for your sins and the fact that he's been raised, you believe in who he is. And so we're not members of the church because necessarily we like the preacher or we think he's talented at preaching. I'm not a member of the church because the meeting place is nearby. May I suggest to you that sometimes we just go to a church because it's close, but the church where you might choose to be a part of might not always be the right one. Do you go to your doctor just because it's the closest doctor, or would you rather go to a doctor because you trust the doctor that you're working with? You might have to drive a little further to go be part of a doctor or a dentist or have a lawyer or an attorney that you trust and that you think is going to be right for you. I'm not a member of the church just because a meeting place, in fact, right now, it's not nearby at all. All right, I'm driving an hour to get here. Um, John 8 and verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the truth that matters. It's the truth that is taught from that church that's certainly much more important than the locality of its meeting place. I'm not also a member of the church because I like the building. There's a very small percentage of people in this world that actually choose a church based upon the architecture of the church. I'm not a member of the church because of the building. You should be a member of the body of Christ because the word has been implanted in your heart and it's able to save your souls. A building is not going to save you at all. Don't choose a church based upon architecture or just based upon proximity, just by, based upon likes. Also, I'd suggest to you, not a member of the church because of its recreational activities. Some people are choosing churches today kind of like consumers. They want to go to the church that's going to provide them with the most food, that's going to take their kids on trips to you know, Kings Island and Six Flags and is going to entertain their kids. Uh, they provide you know, comedy routines and um, entertainment for the family. Jesus said something about that in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, and verse 26, when people were showing up just because of the food, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Jesus says, you're here for the wrong reasons. You shouldn't be here just for the food. He says, don't labor for the food which perishes. That's, you know, your meat and potatoes. Don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because the God, the Father, has set a seal on Him. All right? So we're not members of the church because of its food, because of their social activities, their recreational activities. Certainly, I hope that you can get together with members one-on-one um, -on -one and spend time with them. That's important to develop relationships. Um, but the drawing power that should bring you to be part of the church has a lot more to do with Jesus, the head of the church, and the truth that's taught than just uh, the consumer-oriented offers of churches today. We're also, I remember when I was in Kokomo, there was a, there was a church that was rapidly growing, and uh, they did an article in the paper, and they asked a the guy, why did you go to church here? He says, because they've got the best biscuits and gravy in town. I'm just thinking that's maybe not a great reason to be a part of a church. I'm glad you like their biscuits and gravy, but I uh, don't know if, I, I don't know. I, I just don't see anything about Peter making biscuits and gravy in my scriptures. I'm also not a part of the church because of its youth or because it's large. Sometimes we just get to be part of a church because, well, it's large, so they must be doing something right. And that doesn't really matter. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 20, there was only eight people that entered the ark in Noah's day. That was a very small group of people. But that group of people was the group of people that were right, who had obeyed what God said so that they could be saved from the coming flood. And so the size of a congregation does not matter. 
Um, the age of a congregation doesn't matter. Sometimes, again, we have this very consumer-oriented viewpoint as to what church we want to be a part of. We want a church that has a lot of young people for our children. I, I hope I, it's great when churches have young people because it means that we're developing, hopefully, the next generation to be part of the church. But that's not actually really a reason why you should be part of a church. You know, take a look at Acts 19 and verse 7. Just a quick point that I make with you. But there, the church at Ephesus only had, when you read verse 7, Paul comes to town, and this church at Ephesus, it says, verse 7, the men were about 12 in all. There's only 12 people that were part of this local church. And Paul takes his time to work with this church. I believe the church of Ephesus grew. It became a very stable church. Jesus, uh, Paul spent three years there teaching daily. The word got out to everybody that was in Asia, it says. Um, so I'm sure that it grew. But Paul didn't go there because of the young people or because it had a large membership. That wasn't a reason for going there. It really shouldn't be our key focus or motivation. And we don't really choose a church it's just because it has a lot of, of friendly people. I, I, I hope people are friendly, by the way. Galatians 5 says that we should be kind and we should be gentle. And those things are important that we be friendly. But it's, there's friendly people at your local country club, too. Um, the guy that works the hot dog stand is usually pretty friendly. That is a, that's not the key point of focus when we think about why we should be a member of the church. Um, there, th these may be primary reasons why some are members of churches today. And if you, if you ask and just go around Anderson, go visit local restaurants today after church service and say, why do you go to the church where you go? Well, because they got a ton of young people because, oh, they, they really, you know, they've got this awesome arcade and my kids love it. Um, they, they, they would give you a lot of these reasons. Oh, they're just so friendly. Oh, the, the building is just beautiful. It's, um, it, it's this old piece of architecture in downtown Anderson. Um, because my preacher is just so awesome. He's just so dynamic. He's so fun to hear. I go to church because I've just, my parents went there, my grandparents went there. These would be reasons that people would give you for why they go to the churches they go to. But I'm just going to suggest to you these aren't the right reasons. They might be reasons, but they're not the right reasons. So let me tell you why I'm a member of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Why I'm a member of his body. And it doesn't have anything to do with a lot of the things we've just mentioned. The first reason I'm a member of the church is because... I heard and I believed the gospel. Take a look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Here Peter is presenting his reason why people should be followers of Jesus Christ. And as he begins to preach this sermon, just 50 days after these same people would have called for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, put him on a cross... In Acts 2, verse 22, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, you have crucified him, you have put him to death, and God has raised him What's the key reason why Peter thought that these Jews should turn to Jesus Christ? Well, he says there's a few facts that you need to consider about this Jesus. First of all, he was a real man. He has a real name, Jesus. He's from a real city, the city of Nazareth. He was attested by God to you. How? Why do you think Jesus is any different than any other man? Why do you think someone that came from Nazareth is someone that I should put my trust in and be a follower of? Because he's a man that's been attested by God to you by miracles. You guys have seen him um, feed 5,000 people. You've heard of him healing the blind and the deaf and the lame. You certainly heard of his miracles, right? 
You've seen his wonders, the fact that your rabbis neglected the poor, but he was willing to preach to the poor. You people could care less about the widow, but he commended the widow who gave her little two mites into the treasury. Some of you could could care less about the lepers. You see them as outcasts. You want to stay as far away from as possible. But Jesus, it was a wonder that he was willing to care for the people that everybody else rejected. You've heard of the signs. He was born in Bethlehem. That was going to be the city of the Savior. You've heard of the prophecies that he has fulfilled. You've heard of the miracles, the wonders and signs. And most importantly, and most obviously, you people right here in Jerusalem know that Jesus was just dead on a cross 50 days ago, and everybody around here is a buzz because we've seen him walking and talking and people have been touching him. He's been raised from the dead. I want you to be a part of his body, his people, because Jesus is alive and he can bring you to life as well. He can bring you out of the deadness of your sins. He can give you the hope that when you face death, like Vernon talked about earlier in the Lord's Supper, that you one day will live, though we will physically die. You will enter into a new world, an eternity, where you can live with immortality, incorruptibility. Jesus has proven that. And so as he walks through his sermon here, he gets to verse 36. He quotes a couple of passages from Psalms to point out that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. And he says this in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And you know, as much skepticism as the world has thrown at me when I was younger, as much doubt as I sometimes had it in my mind when I was younger, I just can't get around some of the facts that Peter throws out here in this sermon and deny that Jesus is indeed a risen Savior. There's been eyewitness after eyewitness testimony that though he was dead, now he is alive. And the very people who gave their testimony died for that testimony. Why would you die for a lie when you had firsthand proof as to whether or not it truly occurred or not. Maybe people die for a lie because they've heard a lie, but these people had the first-hand opportunity to examine the evidence, and they are all, every apostle, willing to die or be punished or persecuted for it. And so I know assuredly, based upon this evidence, that Jesus is indeed Lord. That means that He's my Master. He's Christ. That means He's the Anointed One. He is prophet, priest, king, judge, all wrapped up into one. He is the Anointed One. And that was the purpose of all of these miracles and wonders and signs that are recorded in Scripture in His resurrection so that we could be confident in that. I'm a member of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. I want to be part of the people who serve Christ because I believe that message, that He was the Savior who was to come, and he was, He's the one who can save me from my sins. That's why it's called the gospel. It's good news because I have sinned. I've rejected God's will, and I've rejected God's commands, and I've done things that are wrong, and He's my Savior. And so as a sinner, the reason why I'm a member of the church is is I wanted to be saved. You know, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, you read a verse down. As you get to verse 37, it says, When they heard this, and I just want you to think about who the they is here a little bit more. The they are the people who were gathered together here for this feast. They had just been here for a feast 50 days before the Feast of Passover. Now they were here for the Feast of Pentecost. They had just been people who were gathered together and released Barabbas, who was a murderer and a criminal, and had Jesus crucified. But now they were here 50 days later, and they've just heard the evidence that This Jesus was risen from the dead. And so when they heard this, that this Jesus, 
whom they crucified, who they were chanting, crucify him, crucify him, go ahead. If, if all the leaders of Israel want to get rid of him, then we'll just give, cast our vote for that too. When they realize that the one that you just crucified is your king, he's your Lord, he's the one that one day you will stand before in judgment and he has the power and authority to allow you to enter into his eternal kingdom or not. You've killed him. It says they were cut to the heart because they realized, oh no. We just killed the king. We called out for the death of the king. How is God going to look at us now when we have to stand before him? And so they realized they'd sinned. They'd murdered him. They'd rejected the king. And now that king was alive again. I'm a member of the church because just like these people realized that they were sinners, I realized that in my life there's been times that I haven't let Jesus rule the throne of my heart. I've rejected him as my king, and I'm going to have to stand before him. And yet, thankfully, he's a merciful king. He's a gracious king. He is a forgiving king who is willing to wipe out those transgressions. And as a sinner, I want to be saved, just like those people on Pentecost did. And so I'm a member of the church because I believed the gospel I know that I've sinned and I want to be saved. And thirdly, I've also learned what I must do. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said to them, and whenever I study this passage with somebody, I say, can you just find me two conditions in verse 38 that Peter shares? And here they are. Peter said to them, repent. Okay, the word repent means change your mind about Jesus. You rejected him before. It's time for you to receive him. Okay, you threw him out as a criminal. You didn't want to do what he said before. Now it's time to obey him. Repent. Do a 180. Repent and let every one of you be baptized. Do you see those two conditions? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by his authority. Realize that he's got authority over your life. He calls you to change your mind. He calls you to be baptized. And so when these people learn what they must do, they did it. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46 says, Jesus asked the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? This is what the apostle of Jesus Christ, Peter, called these first Christians to do. To turn from their sins and be baptized into him. And so I learned what I must do. I'm a member of the church because I learned what I need to do so that I can uh, do what Jesus Christ, the one who has all authority, has called me to do. This wasn't, by the way, just something for the people of Israel in Acts 2 on Pentecost. Look at Acts 2 and verse 39. It says, the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. I believe that afar off is reference to the Gentile people. The children of Israel would be future generations of Jewish people. Those who are far off would be those that the, the Jews had no contact with, no fellowship with. They were considered part of the, the outcast nations, the Gentile nations. The promise that you can be saved, forgiven of your sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which I believe is salvation that the Holy Spirit had promised just earlier, that promise, remission of your sins, it's to you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, I want you to think about this idea of having your sins remitted and what that means. Something that, that I've done before, I didn't pass out any paper today, so we're not going to do it right now. But I would encourage you to think about this. What does remission of sins mean? I want you to think about, just in your head, I want you to think about the three, in your mind, worst sins that you've ever committed. Now, I know all sin is equal, all sin is wrong in the sight of God. I don't, don't. But I also know that sometimes in our minds, there's just things that we've done or that we've said 
that we have a hard time forgiving ourselves of. If you could have a piece of paper out right now, I would encourage you to write down those three things on a piece of paper. And you don't have to do it physically. So what's the remission of sins? Well, the remission of sins is where I can wad that up. The worst things that I can possibly think of that I've done in my life, I can wad all of that up and I can throw it in the trash can. And I know that that's what God has done with that piece of paper too. He's going to remember it no more. He puts it in the past. It's not that God has divine amnesia and doesn't have the ability to remember. It's that God is not going to hold that sin against me anymore because he's offered me the remission of that sin, of those sins, all of them, every one of them. By the way, do you think murder is a pretty bad sin? I know all sin is equal, but these people had Jesus murdered. And Peter, the friend of Jesus, who spent three years with him, is saying, you know what? I'm going to give you the opportunity to wipe the slate clean. You think if Jesus can forgive murder, do you think God can forgive anything? He can. And he's willing to right here. I learned this promise was for me. And I know there's things that I've said and that I've done that are wrong And I'm so thankful that God was willing to say, I'll forgive you of those things. I'm a member of the church because that's a promise for me. I'm a member of his church because I repented. I changed my mind about Jesus. I realized I needed to quit rejecting him and I was baptized. That's what these people did. Verse 41, Peter, it says, tells them, be saved. In other words, don't just keep thinking about what I told you to do. Take action. What action do they take? Verse 41 says, Those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then finally, I'm a member of his church because the Lord added me to his church. A lot of, a lot of churches out there, they're going to make you go through some sort of a, a, a process that you never can find in your Bibles. They'll say, just, just say a sinner's prayer, for example. You know, Peter never said anything about a sinner's prayer here in Acts 2. And he never actually told anybody to say a sinner's prayer who was someone who had not yet heard about Jesus Christ. Some churches are going to make you go through um, some sort of series of classes. You've got to go through their course. Some churches are going to vote you in. None of that happens in Acts 2. No, once these people believed the message that was taught, made the decision to turn from their sins, be baptized into Jesus Christ, the Lord added them to his church. We don't have to join anything. The Lord puts you in. You're part of his church. That's why I'm a member of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Do you think the world has complicated that a little too much? If you're familiar with what a lot of denominations do when it comes to this entire process, a lot of this has been very, very complicated. But this truly, I want you to realize, is very simple. Do you believe the facts that prove Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That he's performed miracles, that he's fulfilled prophecy, that he's been raised from the dead. Do you believe those things about him? If you believe those things about him, have you sinned? Is there something here in these scriptures that you have violated? Have you lied? Have you cheated? Have you stolen? Have you fornicated? Uh, Have you cursed? Have you sinned? If you've sinned, you've violated God's will for how we're supposed to be living this life. Do you need to be forgiven of that sin? And change your mind about sin. Start following the one who lives sinlessly. Be baptized into him. Have you done that? That's what these people did. You know, I know that there's a lot of people out there in the world, a lot of churches out there in the world that could say baptism is really not that important. You but baptism is linked to the authority of Jesus Christ in this passage and to the remission of your sins. If I want my sins forgiven, I'm going to quit bickering about baptism, whether I should or shouldn't do it. I'm just going to do what verse 38 says and what these first Christians did. 
I'm just going to do it because my Lord said that we should do it because his apostle said that we should do it. So I'm going to do it. And I did it. And when you do that, the Lord will add you to his church. I want to ask a final question as we think about this with an illustration here. You know, how and when did I become a member of the Welch family? I became a member of the Welch family. It's pretty easy. When I was born on May 10th, 1979. When I was younger, I used to think it was pretty cool. I was born in the 70s. I don't think that's very cool anymore that I was born. I feel old when I say that. Older. I was born into my family. When I was born into my family, I automatically just became, you know, Joshua Welch. How and when do you become a member of God's family? We'll take a look at John chapter 3. It says in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. First of all, if I'm going to be in the kingdom, I've got to be born again. What does that mean? Nicodemus asked the question, well, how can I be born when I'm old? Well, it's not a physical birth. Jesus says in verse 5, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. How am I born into God's family? Well, I'm born of water. I think that's a reference to baptism. It's a reference to baptism. There have been some people who have argued, oh, well, that means that you're just physically born, but then, then you're spiritually born after that. That's just a reference to a woman's water breaking. You know that phrase, her water broke? It didn't come around to the 18th century. I don't think that's what Jesus meant. By the way, it's not water that breaks either. That's just a phrase we use. It's amniotic fluid. It's two different things. That's not what Jesus meant in John chapter 3 when he talks about being born of water. Let's just go with the obvious meaning that agrees with Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Titus chapter 3. It's all over the scriptures. Being born of water means that you're baptizing in Jesus Christ. Being born of the Spirit means that you make the decision to follow the Spirit's teaching and leading and live for Him. When you make that decision, I'm going to follow what the Spirit has taught, and I'm going to receive what the Spirit has promised, and I'm going to be baptized in Jesus Christ. You can enter into God's kingdom. You are born again. And that's when you become a member of God's family. You don't pray into it. That's not what Jesus said. You're not voted into it. That's not what Jesus said. In fact, a lot of people who were in Jesus were voted out of synagogues. You are born into Jesus Christ by believing in Him, turning from your sins, being baptized into Him.